Well, Alex Malley, uh, thanks for joining us on CEO Hub. It's great to have you. Now, um, the CPA is obviously a long-standing member organisation for accountants, but it's also a corporation, isn't it? It's, an, it's a commercial enterprise that you're running. So it's a matter of, I guess, um, managing both of those both of those things. Yeah, it is. I mean, look, we're 125 years old now, and uh, a really large organisation. So if you're going to be true to your member theme and core to providing value for them, you've actually got to be efficient with your resources. And with having 10 board directors who are accountants, you can be assured that there's, a, there's an efficiency and commercial drive for it. So as a CEO, do you, do you feel like you're a CEO of a, um, you know, of a commercial entity um, that you know, possibly would be one of the top 100 or 200 companies on the ASS if it was listed? Is that the way you operate it or do you have to more look, lean towards being the CEO of a member organisation? Well, that's the challenge. And, and the, the core of it always is about what's the best for the member. But fundamentally, you can't do that without being commercial. So more and more, the commercial drive is becoming a, a large part of my role. And you're right, dimensionally, we're in the you know, top 200 or thereabouts as an organisation, seventh largest globally. So there's, a, there's an imperative that goes with the public, public organisation almost. So driving those commercial rates, but you'll always have the scenario where you've got a professional development program that's actually not going to make us money, but it is in the interest of the members. So you've always got those balancing items all, all the time. And we're funded well, we, we're a good commercial business, so it allows us a bit of flexibility. And you mean by that that you're profitable? Well, look, we don't, we don't make profits. We, we actually drive for member value, but certainly when I came into the organisation, the first year, part of the first year metrics was saying, we really do need to look at the organisation for cleanliness, efficiency. Mm -hmm. And certainly we posted a large surplus last year on the basis that we wanted to reframe the business. So you're surplusable. We, we, well, we produce surpluses, yes, if, if, if we've run efficiently. But we're also in, of the mood where we think it's, we've got a project that's worthy for members that we would run a deficit in a particular year. Right. So what sort of philosophy do you bring uh, to the business of being a CEO? How do you approach it? Look, I'm, I'm very much, um, I guess, I have a vision and I have an energy that I like to bring to the organisation. I, I use a term very openly with my leaders in particular and with the staff broadly that I want to live with people who have the courage to fail. Which, you know, in the context of a statement by a CEO, you know, conjures up all sorts of things. But for me, that conjures up the question of why couldn't we do that? And why not talk to people within the organisation about whether that's possible? So I feel a real uh, need to, even at my own level, to prove to the organisation and, and the staff that I'm willing to be out of the box and do something different. To, to not just say I want that, but to actually do it myself. As Does it take a lot of courage to fail? I mean, do you, do you have the courage to fail? I, look, I always have. I don't know why, but I, I, uh, I guess because I failed a few times as a young guy and realised that most people's ego are so focused on themselves, they won't remember your failure for very long. Uh, and I do recall That's this. That's interesting. Thing. Well, it's idea. true. I, I, I remember going for a role and I got down to the last two and I was asked to sit for a, you know, one of those testing processes and I just went to water. I think it must have been some throwback from my childhood. And I remember leaving thinking, my God, I could never move forward from this. I've just been an abject failure and it dawned on me within a day or two that people are so driven by their own personal needs that you can afford to fail a few times and no one's going to notice. Now perhaps in my role a few more will notice now but I think that's what should be what a CEO is willing to do. I, I'm, I'm more than happy if I made a call and it cost the organisation I lost my job. I'm willing, I'm not silly but I'm willing to take that chance because I think that's what we need to do as leaders. So when did you first decide in your career that you wanted to be a leader, a CEO? Was there a kind of a moment when that hit you? I guess I can always see my, I could see myself in various iterations of my life, always being in and around the conversations that mattered. And, and I guess I had a natural capacity to influence, but an immaturity along with it. So I'd find myself, whether it was in my university career and other parts of my career in the past, where I, I almost stumbled into these influential places and conversations but not quite knowing the outcome of those of my impact and so I guess there was a natural ability to find the place to influence and naturally want to influence. In the last decade I've probably learned a lot more about the impact I have on others and so you know you, you become more aware of if I push this I know that's going to create a bit of tension for those sorts of guys because they tick a different way and that's why I think it's really important to you know, be comfortable in your own skin 
And whatever they say of me, Alan, in, in any workplace, I think that's the one thing that becomes clear. I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm happy to call a failure if that's what I've been associated with. I'm happy to call a success if I've been associated with it. Tell us a bit about your career up to this point. What, are, what sort of organisations have you been leading and well, been involved with? Uh, you know, after a, a bit of a colourful career at school, um, I decided that uh, what do you mean one by of the colourful, colourful, well, you know, a bit of time on the sidelines for a week or two here and there, but but more out of a boredom, but loved the school atmosphere and environment, and subsequently become lifelong friends with the the very headmaster who punished me, but more around this sense of uh, wanting to go back into education because I loved the school environment, but thought the teaching could be better. So what better way to do it than do it yourself? So I got involved in education for some time and, and in that time had a lot of time in lecture theatres with large groups of kids and, and learned how to hold their interest, learned how to engage with them and learned a lot through the engagement with young people. Developed a consultancy that grew to quite large dimensions and you know I got a couple of offers f to purchase that. And then somewhere around my sort of uh, late 30s, early 40s, it, I just felt I wanted to round it with some experience and always felt that I had a destiny to be a CEO, to, to lead an organisation. And so I've had a couple of roles as CEO now and six or seven years of that. I suppose to some extent in the CPAs you're in, back in education. A lot of what, a lot of what the CPAs does is educate people and it, that's it does. a big part and, of its role. And it does that at the, at the youthful level as well as the mature level. And so you're right, it, it's a, there is a comfort zone there. And the role before this, I was CEO of the Urology Surgeons of Australia and New Zealand. So I, I, I naturally keep finding myself in environments that both need a commercial imperative and have a political imperative and, a, and an advocacy imperative and a complexity. And for whatever reason, I seem to enjoy that complexity capability. Where would you like to take the CPAs? Um, what's the, what would you like to be remembered for? Well, look, I guess I'd like to be remembered for more than anything to, for having a succession plan that, that, you know, for the first time in a long time, our organisation's led from within. And so that, to create that momentum. But certainly the vision for the organisation, we're currently uh, on, a, on a world stage, to really make it clear to young people that a profession of accounting gives them every choice that you'd ever want in any, in any market at any time. And so to really sell the message that the that accounting qualification is the best ticket in life, it's something I intrinsically believe. And so for CPA Australia to be really well known as a promoter of the best parts of what a professional is in accounting, and also the breadth that it's going to offer our, our members into the future, and, and to be known globally as the world's best member service organisation. And that's creating an enormous energy in the business, that, that, that ambition. Uh, a good ambition. And on that note, we'll have to leave it. Thanks very much for joining Thanks us, Alex. Thanks very much, Alan. Thank you.